Monday. Oh, Monday. see, I don't, it's bank holiday. Mm. I've been corrected. I've just spoke to Peter Fury and he said the, the same. Monday over here, yeah. He goes, what, what day is it today? And I was like, yeah, doesn't matter. But welcome, welcome, welcome. It is the boxing debate. And I think we're on episode 14. But before I start, I've got to welcome a new member of the panel. And I'm so delighted to have her on the channel. Women in boxing is something that is not celebrated enough. We've got the beautiful, the intelligent, the witty, our sister from America, Karma Serene. So welcome to Karma. We've got Base the Kid who loves the ladies, as we know already. He knows every single woman. That is to do with boxing everywhere. Base the Kid. <laughs> we've got Base the Kid. And we've got Maestro, a.k.a. another master knowledge from the shores of the USA. Correct. Thank you so much, October Red. And thank you always for running this great panel discussion. I appreciate it. Listen. Four heads are better than one. But we've got to say hello to the chat. MCB, patiently waiting. The wait is over. We are here. Uh, good live earlier. Yeah, I've got a sore throat from shouting my mouth off last night at Fraser Clark to use the clinch more. But we're going to cover all of that. Muller, good evening to you. Philip, good evening to you. Iceman, oh, look at that. Salute karma. Hold on. What about the rest of us? Good evening, Iceman. Untraceable, how are you? And boxing pound for pound, Jack as well and anybody else that is watching silently in the bushes taking notes of what we're doing here anyway base should we do, should we start with yesterday i think it's should we do it should we go back from yesterday and then i'm going to get you guys to cover some of the fights that i've been a bit naughty and i haven't watched base you yeah i there. guess you should do it. it's the most freshest i guess in everyone's mind you were there, base. I mean, I was there mm -hmm. for the, the weigh in. You know, I was shouting goal Fraser in the midst of um, Team Fabio. Um, so, yeah, that was interesting at the weigh in. But anyway, you were there. Talk to us a little bit about that atmosphere. Bring us in there with you because I was at home and everyone else was too. No, do you know what? It was a very raucous atmosphere. It was very lively, good natured. Um, you know, the big Albanian community, they was always in there as, as usual for Florian Marku. But everyone had a large chunk of their fan base with them. Like Callum Simpson had a huge amount of support from Barnsley come down. Um, Chris Congo had a, had a lot more support than I was actually expecting initially. So him, obviously, Congo, um, Fabio Wardley had a huge amount. Frazier had a, a, a decent chunk, although I'm not sure how many uh, there wasn't as many midlands people as i was expecting to be there and he probably was a bit vexed you didn't show up for the support but um yeah that no, was good it, there was definitely a good 12 13 000 people in there there was only a couple of bits right at the top that was topped off so it was live what about um what fight do you want to start off with i think should we start off with um I'm going to jump straight into it. I think we should go Chris Congo first. And only because everything, how that fight, the build-up was there. You know, obviously with the shoving, when Florian was in the middle of his, uh, I think it was IFL, so credit to them, their interview. And that kind of stoked it already brewing below the scenes fight. Um, I personally, I wanted Chris Congo to, to win. I remember he posted up, you know, I think he received some DMs of some racial slurs. You know, it got really nasty with him. So, you know, I was one of them that was definitely cheering on Chris Congo. But I don't know. Do you want? I'll tell you what. Should we start with um, Karma? Did you your thoughts on that fight and everything around it? I thought the winner, won, the proper person won. Um, I think. Did anybody else notice this? Yes. Florian Marku was one-handed in that fight. He was not what? throwing his right hand at all. Did anybody That's else notice that? He was, but he was using he was using both of them to hook around the back of the head and then punch with the other hand. <laughs> he was he only was, using one hand was, at a time. It was yeah, it was dirty tactics, but I think the right person won. But um, something was wrong with his hand. I do believe something was wrong with his hand. I don't want to see it again. I'll tell you that. I'm I'm definitely biased. Eken APC Bishop. I am overtly biased. 
but I do know a little bit. And I'm one step further than you because I'm sat here on a channel that you're commenting on. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Are you biased? Very. I am too. I did want Chris Congo to win. So I'm, I'm really happy for him. Um, he, his career is a little bit storied, uh, yet he does need to move up. I think he's um, a bit of a, I don't like the term weight bully, but he does definitely need to move up. Um, I think he's outgrown that division. What do you think about like how he came on in the fight? Because the first few rounds, I probably would have said that Marku looked stronger. He did. But, he, but then like later on, I don't know what happened, kind of like a light switch like kicked on with uh, Congo and he was starting to like really whip into the body. Like there was such a, a nice variation of shots coming from it. It was really good to see. That and I, I think Marku hurt himself during that fight. I, I, I want to watch it back. Okay. Cause like you said, it was just a, it was a story of two halves. Marku was doing very well. And then he just wasn't there. He was just there to be hit. And that's exactly what Chris Conco did. I'm happy for him. Mm. Maestro? I think that essentially Marco was a very limited fighter who couldn't really make very many adjustments. Um, you know, he didn't have a way really to, to do anything other than attempt to rough up uh, Chris Congo on the inside. And... Mm. He didn't have many answers for Chris Congo, definitely in the long range and even in the mid range. Um, and it got to the point where even when he got past the mid range on the inside, there really wasn't any fluid boxing taking place. It was just rough up tactics. And once Chris figured that out, I think it became a very easy fight for him to kind of win and dominate. Um, at the beginning, he was kind of trying to figure those things out, but once he realized what the game plan was and once it became evident that there was no really plan B or plan C or plan D, it became a very straightforward fight for Chris Congo. Um, keep it on the outside. When Marku comes in with his roughhouse tactics, try to tie him up, wait for the referee to, to order a break or reset things and then get back to dominating on the outside again. I, I, it, that's really the way I saw the fight. So I, I didn't. They, I might have missed a round or two because I was actually flying back from the West mm -hmm. Coast uh, and was watching this on on the plane. Um, and I had a, tri a layover flight, and there. But it, that that's what I saw for the mo most part. Looks like you're right, Karma SWJ. Shout out to you, Sam Jones. Says Mark, whose right hand yeah. was injured. So there you go, spot on. Those detailed eyes. Face. Yeah, look, um, to be honest, I think the game plan was to be competitive in the first few rounds to make, you know, to make Marku have to work. And then ultimately, knowing that he's going to try and box with you, use that to your advantage and his disadvantage, because everyone knows Kongu is a better boxer than Florian Marku in general. So you keep him occupied with that a couple stabs to the body here or there, slow him down. And then when he's going to just be trying to load up for big shots towards the end of the fight, rather than actually working, that's when you work and you just out, outland him, outlast him. And that's exactly how the fight played out. That's how I expected it to go. Um, I do agree with um, Karma and I think the chat saying that he needs to move up. I actually said that in my weekend rap video which will release as soon as this is finished it's still uploading it as we speak but yeah i think that you could tell there's a lot of punches that he looked like he was trying to throw his entire body into them and they was having very little effect so i think yeah his days at 147 are numbered i mean the guy's like six foot one and you can tell by his body it's it's very difficult to make that weight um but yeah, I think I think he'll move up probably maybe after this fight now, considering that he's just got that sort of that big vindicating victory on the third try. But yeah, it it played out the way I expected. I did expect um, him to win, all because I I thought that Florian would be brash enough to think that he could box with him rather than just be a bully and and roughhouse. 
And then yeah. when he started Roughhouse and he was very crude with it, hence why he was getting so many warnings, even though Howard Foster, well, everyone knows I dislike Howard Foster immensely, but it took him, what, seven rounds before he finally took a point off, considering all the back of the head shots and the, yeah, you know, holding the back of the head and the rabbit punching, all of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, deserved winner. And I, you know, I was scoring it. I said uh, after the fight, I had it 91, 98 to Chris uh, with the point off. And anything other than a UD would have been a criminal uh, proceedings. But yeah, it was a unanimous decision. Good stuff. Yeah, I'm really, I'm just really happy for him as well. You saw the emotion. What we saw at the end of it is the emotion in um, Chris's face, like how much it means to, you know, these fighters to get that win when they are the underdog, when everyone's chanting against him. Yeah. So it was it was nice to see him just just take it all in and, and get emotional about it. Do you know what I mean? Emma Willie, shout out to you. Mark, who was never good. Congo is slightly better, but both guys ain't it. That's what I like about Emma. She'll just say what whatever she wants. But Emma's one of the original subscribers. So shout out to you. Uh, did Sam Jones see his fitness to work certificate or something? Sounds like, um, is it Copium? Copium. 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 Yasmin Malik, good evening to you. Uh, what made me laugh is when he went Southport and Congo was finding it easier in the corner. Uh, and the, they were shouting for him to switch back. Um, Bruce Bruce Gas, Boxing, Jazz and more is uh, saying hi there to the beautiful Karma. Aaron, Marku is low level. Already got a gift decision against Para uh, and against uh, Prol Dan. So it literally is what it is. Um, can, can I ask sorry. you, um, October, like where do you guys see Curse Congo going from here? Um, just looking at the welterweight division, I know Karma says she thinks he'll move up. I, I don't really see much that he can do at 154. Not with not with the top guys there personally. I mean, is is it a domestic level fight? Is, you know what what you see in his future? I don't know because he he's coming off the loss with Echo Esserman, isn't he? This this was kind of like the fight after that. Um... There was all sorts of names put in the mix with him. I'm sure Connor Ben's name was put in the mix with him at, at some point. Um, who knows? You know, th this is sort of like his comeback fight. So I think that's going to be, I, can't, I don't know, is my honest answer. That's down to him and his team. But I know his name's been mixed up in the mix with all sorts. But it, it just seems as if maybe he just hasn't had that projection and trajectory and, and consistency in his career. He seems to have missed out on a lot, if that makes sense. I don't know. What's anybody else thinking? Um, I think he's going to be around that, you know, that British scene. When I spoke to him on Wednesday, he said, I said to him, look, if like you win this, like, how does it go? But if you lose, like, ultimately, what's the step? And he said, well, look, there's still many more like you know, sort of big British knights for me. So that pretty much tells me that he feels as if his level is British, maybe fringe European type level. I don't think he sees himself as a, a world beater right now. He may think he may get buoyed by this win and think, okay, actually I can get up there. Who knows? But I think that's where he thinks he is. He's have big nights in Britain against other British opposition as he's been having before with McKinson and Esselman. Mm. And maybe that's, that's, that's what his, what his ceiling is. But if that is a ceiling, it's no problem as long as he gets paid. Well, mm, shout out to Aaron Daly and for the donation of four pounds. Uh, Adam Beanie Smith says maestro is class always has been gives his opinion and doesn't take sides. That's big cap because my stroll can be very biased. <laughs> Folk over here in the UK should take note. My stroll is very biased. <laughs> so let's not get it twisted there. But thank well, you very much. I think David Morrell Jr. because of what I was saying about him last week? No, it's just that it, the thing is people like to pretend that they're not biased when everyone's got it, it's just some have got it more yeah, than there others. There are definite styles in boxing that I definitely like a lot. That's mm. for sure. And there's also characters in the sport that I like a lot. Um, but in terms of my predictions, when I do make them, I don't think I'm, I'm biased. Or a after watching a fight in terms of how I look at 
what happened in the ring. I try to be, you know, even keel, but there, I, I'll admit it. There are fighters I definitely like. I think that's the case with all of us. We're just not ashamed to admit it here, but I'm going to move on to um, obviously the next fight. Um, shout out to Vidal Riley. I thought you were going to talk about the fight with y your guy from Croatia, Alan the Bat, the Savage. No, Bat no, sorry, I'm not going to. No, I mean you can if you want. Okay. I mean, I base, you, call, base you with that. Was you there? Was you in the I arena at five o'clock? Morning. I guess I didn't have to. But yeah, I, I missed the first two rounds live, but I was I got there from the end of the second round. Okay. But he did what he's supposed to do, like took out a low level guy, although admittedly Robinson's got a chin and a half on him. Um he looked he looked like he should have been gone numerous times, but he's either got good powers of recovery or he's just got a good balance because he stayed on his feet. He was complaining when it got when it got called off. Um, even though like he's he was throwing some very, very slow, you know. It's, it didn't look like he was throwing punches. Like he was just moving his arm, and it just <laughs> that, that, that literally how it looked. Um, but he was complaining, and then they was like, "No, well, he goes." There's like, "No, you was taking the battering." No, but I was okay in that round. Like, well, no, look at your eye. Oh, is it that bad? That's literally I was getting on backstage. He 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 wasn't with it, but um, yeah, heart. But you know. Babich does what Babich does and entertaining. You, you got to be in the arena when he's fighting. So does he fight next then? Babich? No idea. He should no, be he... he should be fighting a cruiserweight in my opinion because I just don't see him being very competitive that as a heavyweight. Not not against even low ranking top 15 guys. Because the guy he fought on on Sunday, I mean he should if you want to be viewed as someone who's going to be in contention as a as a heavyweight you need to get rid of that guy a, lo a lot earlier especially considering how clean he was hitting him from early on you know and you know he he the guy never actually went down officially he was kind of stopped on his feet um and was fully conscious he just didn't have any skill or any defense to prevent what was happening to him so personally the only thing i was going to say about babbage october red is that i i, I think he should be fighting a cruiserweight. And the funny thing is, is that Boxer, who he just fought under, has plenty of cruiserweights uh in the in the UK that they that they can set up matches for him uh with. So I, I see him as as needing to go down to the cruiserweight division personally. What do you think, Karma? Who would he fight at the cruiserweight division? I don't he think fight. he would be effective there either. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't rate him very much. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm kind of with Palmer on this. I don't, I don't rate him either. I just think that the, based on what Bay said, which I agree with, he's a guy who's an attraction who's gonna give exciting fights. So that that's really what it is. I mean, and as a heavyweight, again, he's just a knockout waiting to happen. I mean, if that's what they want to, at least I don't see him as just a. a brutal knockout waiting to happen in the cruiserweight division i'm not saying i think he's going to win fights i just see the heavyweight fights as being entirely uncompetitive uh, uh, maybe bridgeweight would be better then because the, the, the pool is smaller he had a shot at the bridgeweight title he got knocked out in the first round so you know that's the, that's the going against he current. can't just go up and down until you find <laughs> somewhere you're gonna be good at there you go all right, I didn't want to waste too much time at that. I just those are what I wanted to say about the bad Allen, the Babbage mm -hmm. Savage, who I believe is still with Dillian, is he not? I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, Dillian yep. keeps his uh keeps his fighters as long as they obviously put the work in for him. Um Vidal Riley, Mikhail Lowell. Um yeah. Shout out to Vidal Riley. Because he was, I didn't realize that he had a broken rib. Uh, I think that was in round one. Um, and I was saying, why is he not sitting down on his shots? Why is he not committing? Why is he, you know, really trying to go in there and hurt Mikhail? But uh, he came out after that. Mikhail oh. had obviously given him, whacked him and had broken one of his ribs. Okay. So he had to keep moving to Very make true. sure he wouldn't land another one of those shots on him. I don't know. Base, what did you see while you was there? Um, I just saw him kind of 
boxing the way he usually does. Although he he did say in the um when I spoke to him on Thursday that you know he was gonna you know he wasn't gonna present a target to him but he wouldn't also back off he's not he's not gonna run he's not gonna you know he's not gonna run from the bullies like he never has he never will so i thought he would maybe go to uh step on the gas a, a little bit more maybe throw um you know a few more spiteful shots towards the end of the fight when you know maybe Macau the was a bit more tired but he had the energy reserves to keep moving and to sort of yeah box at distance mm. in terms of a fan fight it wasn't great to watch from that aspect but in terms of a performance i thought it was a you know a very good performance it, to me he, he he you know it was a clean sweep uh, i'm not sure how the judges gave Macau two rounds to in that fight at all but um yeah it, it was just it's a shame because the because the rest of the card was so action-packed it then by default became like the worst fight because it all it was was a schooling but it wasn't like a you know loads of punches landed it was just you know it was very much outside boxing box and move but yeah i i enjoyed it and he's got a pretty his, his ceiling is high as long as he stays composed and disciplined and one thing i do like about vidal um is that like some you know a bit like devin haney to a degree he's not gonna do risky tactics or do things out of character just because maybe you know the crowd might be doing x y and z he's gonna he's gonna get through the fight he's gonna win the fight however he's got to win it against a kind of opponent maybe against someone whose hands ain't as strong as as Mikhail Lawal's he probably even with a broken rib sits in the pocket a bit more and does more just because he he's not as you know cognizant of, of that power like he did with um the the other guy he, he fought before this fight and the one before that um so yeah uh it was cool it just wasn't exciting not at, all. not at all it wasn't exciting at all but i think the fight in the crowd afterwards was more exciting than the, the fight in the ring um eh, I, I respect vidal for sticking to his game plan but it was not a good fight at all um it was a shutout like Bay said uh, the buildup was better than the actual fight. I thought it was going to be much more exciting. I was completely let down, but I'm happy for Riley. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. When the fights are like that, when they're anticlimactical, you really see all of that fuel, face-offs, pulling the belt. The, you know, you're expecting all of this. I always call them bad dates. It's like everyone hypes it up and then you get on the date and it's just dead and you're like, why did I even bother? Right. It gets like that. We've had how many anticlimactical fights um, in boxing before? But base, what happened in the crowd? Like Karma was saying, there was more exciting. I heard that Chev because I didn't see it, but I heard that Chev rolled up. Yep. Yeah. So obviously you had the the section with Isaac and Vidal. Now I knew that they were supposed to have a face off, and Isaac was saying from Wednesday, like, you know, do you want me to bring my belts? Like, what's what's good, <laughs> kind of thing. And they didn't quite know how that was planning out so obviously they've done this at the side and then they're talking obviously the belts on there so i'm like oh does that mean that maybe something else has happened then as he's gone obviously they're, they're having their back and forth chev clark is coming coming through i think he's just him and maybe one other person and obviously right. Isaac calling, yeah chev, come in come in and i think as he's trying to get in i couldn't see exactly because it was on the other side of the ring from me but it looks as if the security was preventing I guess him and the rest of his people being able to come into the camera. And then there was a bunch of like shoving and pushing, but it was more the security guards like stopping them from what I saw. And then it just became like a bunch of different people, you know, all trying to basically bum rush this one little section. And then, yeah, it kind of our screens, our monitors up top, like shut off. And then they went, they cut back to these, the sky broadcasting team, which are standing right next to where it was all happening. So, yeah, that's pretty much what I saw from from my angle. Because uh, I I just saw the cameras like I saw a little bit of a scuffle, and then the cameras obviously zooming out, and I'm on the live thinking, what's going on here? And then the zone, I think, post something like saying, obviously putting up a picture of Chev and saying, kind of like, yeah, our guy's here. Um, but I don't know. But fair play to Chev for going over there because it's like, hold on a minute. I'm I'm here. I'm I'm in the spot. What's happening with this fight? 
and it and it's it's going back to the old adage are we going to get matchroom and boxer working together are their fights going to you know cross over the seas and even after this fight you know when they did like this you know the big announcement and then we had Chris Eubank senior uh, come in, obviously Barry McGuigan come in with Adam Azim, and then obviously Harlem Eubank. And I'm I'm sat at home and I'm looking. I'm thinking, what what's this about? And I've got to ask Base because obviously Base, you're in the cr- what was the crowd reaction to that? Because that's something obviously they would have known about it, but it's it's like it came out of the blue. Well, no, it did it, it did come out of the blue because even though they've put they got everyone's names on the chairs as you've probably known from when you've been there. And I saw Harlem Eubank and Chris Eubank Sr.'s names. I was wondering, like, why are they there? Because initially, obviously, I'm thinking, well, Harlem's going up to 147. That's what Sr.'s kept saying. He's not going to be, um, you know... <laughs> he's, yeah, he's not going to be um, at 140 anymore. So it didn't really make much sense. Then when they went in the ring, there was no reaction to anyone in the crowd. A lot of people was like, huh? And he just... Yeah. Pumped- yeah. It, none of it and the thing is when it's that it's not even a case of oh they said oh well they're in advanced talks this could potentially happen it's like well why are you bringing them together if it can potentially happen it's not signed what's what's the point so it it didn't it felt very anticlimactic and no one really was looking like oh this one could be a good one uh, it just it, it, it just felt out of place what did you guys see it from obviously you watching it at home and obviously you know, Maestro on the aeroplane. What did that look like to you? Because it was total. I didn't even know Adam was going up. It looked it looked uh, disorganized. Um, and my whole thing is, when you do want to set up these face-offs between fighters, the last thing you want is for fighters to be there with entourages. So, yeah. I mean, that always just leads to a big mess. I mean, we saw it. Remember with the Fabio Wardley, uh, David Adelaide situation? Yeah. Right. I mean, just keep the entourages separate. I mean, the, nothing good comes from big entourages at fights, in, in my opinion. Like they should be way away in some other part of the crowd. You bring the one fighter over to face off with one fighter. But in the basis point, why even do that if you don't have something signed or if nothing's been mandated by the BBBOC? It makes zero sense. As for the fight itself, you see, this is the kind of fight that I think. A, a more of an Alan Babich would have been needed to make for some excitement. Uh, and I say that because when you're a slow guy like Lawal, who, by the way, doesn't seem to ever want to throw combinations or volume punch, and all he's doing is slowly plotting around the ring, <laughs> trying to land one jab or one right hand at a time, it leads to these kind of performances. Like, if I'm training this dude, we're just spending probably a few months just working agility ladder and working on like ballistic exercises and getting him fast because his feet look like they've never been trained to move. Uh, I don't care what sport you're playing, basketball, football, uh, badminton, you move like that, you're going to have shitty performances because Regardless of what the sport is, your feet are what's putting you into position to work. Whether it's tennis, whether it's, like I said, basketball, football, like he couldn't play goalkeeper doing that. I mean, he couldn't play shortstop or first base with feet like that in baseball. Uh, He couldn't play badminton or even pickleball with slow feet like that. A pickleball is the new rave, by the way. I don't know if it's hit the UK, but. You know, people in their 50s and 60s, it can't. Oh, come on. Pickleball. I mean, we got we got to start moving these feet uh, when it when it comes to training uh, Lawa, because if if he cannot get himself into position to throw punches, there's no point in being a boxer. Mm -hmm. It's just going to lead to these kind of performances. And it's even worse once you hear. What I heard earlier, which I was not aware of, because like I said, I watched this on on the on the plane. I didn't mention it on the broadcast. That that he had a broken rib. I mean, and you got shut out against a guy with a broken rib. So it's I don't know. Uh, that that's my opinion on that fight. They really need to just work on on speed and on get working on his his footwork. Yeah, yes, it's, that's a good idea. I was thinking about that for Babich. Yeah. 
it's, it, it could be a thing. I'm an advocate for misfits. I definitely am. I think Ryan Garcia would be a great addition as well. Karma. <laughs> it, it, what as what? You know, obviously you've got. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt and disrupt this fight card. But any update in regards to obviously Errol Spence, his trainer? Obviously, we saw him in the ring. He stepped into the ring after the Fondora, Tim Zhu Fondora. Any updates from your side of the world on what's happening with that? Sorry, I'll forget if I don't ask that now. It, it's my assumption that he's going to be fighting Fondora. Um, if they pulled him into the ring, um, they did that for a reason. In the spirit of fairness, Crawford should be fighting Fondora. But also in the spirit of fairness, Fondora should not have a belt. If I mean, if we're going to be political, he should not have a belt. He should not have been fighting for a belt. But uh, politics as usual. So mm -hmm. I'll jump in on that one, October, because it's quite a weird situation. You had a card Saturday in Vegas that was a pay-per-view. We'll leave that to the side for now. But we had two vacant title fights in the same weight class. Uh being ordered by the same sanctioning body. So the WBC ordered essentially two vacant title fights at 154 in the same weight division on the same night. I, I don't think I've ever heard of anything like that happening before. But the reason I bring it up is because uh, Sergei Borachek, who's the Ukrainian, fought on the undercard of that fight against Bryant Mendoza for the WBC interim title at 154 and the WBC mandated that the winner of Zoo versus Fundora uh, pretty much immediately enter into contract negotiations with uh, Boracic in order to keep that title. So it, it looks at least and we all know the WBC changes its rules on, on, on a dime. I mean, they have that thing at the discretion of the WBC and the in their rules allow them to do pretty much whatever they want as we've seen you know but having said that the winner is supposed to fight sergey boracic that that that's what the wbc said going into this fight because sergey boracic was actually supposed to fight fundora for the full interim title uh but they ended up moving fundora from that fight to fight tim zoo and they made that for the full uh oh vacant, God. Full vac vacant what a title. mess <laughs> so now they're in a situation where the winner, Fundora, and I agree with Karma Serene. I mean, it, I actually blame Tim Zhu's corner for that whole fiasco, and we can get into that in a bit. Uh, the fact that they even allowed their fighter to continue on like that, to me, is just trainer malpractice as far as I'm concerned. But the fact is, they're supposed to fight Boracic next. Um, and I, I don't know if there's enough money in the Fundora uh Probably not. I, with, with Crawford to make it Crawford's wild because I heard through the grapevine that Crawford was looking for a $15 million guarantee to fight Tim Zhu. And I don't even know if that fight generates $15 million. And it's my understanding that that's the only reason they then were starting to talk about Errol Spence because if you're paying Crawford $15 million, right, w w what money would have been left over for Tim Zhu at the end of the day? Right. That, that's not a huge fight. Um, so... We'll see what happens with Errol Spence, but Errol Spence is not in a position to fight for a title. Uh, and if they do fight Fundora, it might not even be for a title. Okay. Um, so that that's my understanding of that situation. You guys in the chat can correct me if I'm, if you guys think I'm wrong on any of that. But that's my. Now, thanks for clearing that up because I oh, know we can get into that fight in a bit. But I'm gonna just push back over to the UK. But I needed to ask about that because I would have forgotten. So the main event then, Fraser Clark going in against Fabio Wardley, current British Commonwealth title holder, um, a fight that should have happened a while ago. And obviously we had the purse bid situation. But you know what I find really funny about like the whole of the, the purse bid situation is when Fra it was said that Fraser pulled out of the initial purse bid. And then it's like in other you know, like interviews that we've heard, we pulled him out. So there's always a bit of a, a contradiction on what exactly happened with it because we're saying, oh, it was the right decision at the time to pull him out. 
but I thought he pulled out. And it's very wrangledy tangledy. But we got here. The fight was there. Fraser was going in as the underdog. Everyone's saying, "Oh, we, you know, we haven't seen much of him. Um, the the level of opponent that he's been in has not been the best. You know, amateur and uh, professional, two different things." And and Fabio was a sided, and he was the favourite going in. But obviously, that changed when the fight happened. But I'm going to go to Karma first. Talk us through how you saw that fight, and then I'm going to finish with base because obviously he was there. That fight um, came down to that call, that point deduction. I yep. felt I had um, I had Fabio winning. He would have won it. Ooh, you had Fabio winning. Yeah. Had it not been for the point deduction, I think he would have taken it just by one round, just by one. But Frazier is the one that got the point deducted. Wait, wait. Who hit yeah. who on the belt line? Frazier hit, hit Fabio, Fabio, though. And with no warning, so that point was a bit weird. That, they, I didn't understand that. They didn't give a... Well, they did... He did, he they did get warnings. Uh, um, did he? he did, so yeah, Steve Gray did give him a couple of warnings. They, they, uh, weren't hard, they weren't hard warnings, though, so... Which are I'm not saying they're not. No, bad. They, the thing is, they were. I was ringside. I saw him on several occasions say, "Keep him up." And the time when he he knocked out his gum shield, he also when he went over to corner, he was saying, him, "Keep those shots up." So he he did tell him on a couple of occasions. I'm not saying that he didn't say it. I'm okay. just saying for people on TV, right? And I'm not saying that a anything's a soft or as, as a warning isn't valid, but especially here in the U.S., when a hard warning is given, they actually break the fighters up. They talk to one of the fighters strongly and then they bring them back. And then that's what a viewer watching on TV would immediately say, okay, he's been warned once or he's been Which warned is what twice. They did with Mark, yeah? yeah, but but some referees, and to Base's point, they won't make such a big dramatic demonstration of it. They'll speak to the fighter or even sometimes they'll just be like, raise it up. Yeah. Right? And that's also a valid warning. Um, it's it? a, lot, a lot of people expect always a hard warning but that, that's not always the case. Go for it, Karma. Is that, uh, just saying raise him up, is that a, a hard warning? I mean, if he does it, no, it's not a hard warning. But if he, it's a warning, though. If he says raise it up, and that's the first one, and then later on he talks to him about it, as Bay said he did, and then he does it again, that's technically three warnings, mm. you know? It's not three hard warnings, but there's still three three warnings. Anyway, sorry, base. I, I, I was just jumping no, on. It's, um, it's, common common. Yeah. it's a common I can't remember yeah. what I was saying. But you were saying that you thought, I think, Frazier would have won if it wasn't for the point? No, I said Fabio would have won. Yeah, but she thought, Fab, she thought it was the other way around. Oh, it's the yeah, point. The, right? It's mixed it up. Won. Yeah, I think I think I did. Yeah, yeah. not for, it had not for been the point deduction. You um, think Mark would have won. Mm-hmm. Yeah. However, you could look at you can just look at them and see who won at the end. I mean, basics. He went. He he went to work. Like it was. I said before the fight, it was it's going to come down to whoever could execute. And having that much experience, I felt like he would have been able to execute better. And that's what it was, but they were gassed out like by yeah. the middle of the fight. It, it, I think um, Frazier, like when he was getting his mouthpiece put in, he was like hanging over the ropes. I was like, goodness, like he should not be that exhausted. He collapsed that, at the end of the fight. He did. He did the lowest rung of the rope. He just totally was, collapsed. It was, yeah. They had to pick him up and put him on the stool. Can I add, base? Do you know? Because you were there, they they didn't do post fight interviews. Was the nose broken? It no. Did. Okay. Uh, I was at the. I was at the. There was a post fight press conference, I and he said, "No, his nose, his, his nose isn't broke. It's just, um, it's just over that scar tissue keeps right. opening up." That's the. That's the thing that I wanted to say because you can't really necessarily look at that blood and just pick a winner based on that because broken because nose. in. Every single interview that I've ever seen uh, Fabio Wardley give after that altercation with um, David Nathan Adelaide. Gorman. And Nathan Gorman. Gorman That's yeah, where we got it first. Even uh, They must do heavy sparring with like open face 
uh, headgear because he always seems to be marked up. Yeah, use. He does. And in the week of this fight, I mentioned it to my brother Joe Abi, Ringside Reporter Live. You guys should check him out. That I was kind of concerned about something opening up going into this fight because he had he looked marked a, up on the bridge of the mm -hmm. nose, but he was also marked up in other areas of his face as well. It's and I said it's something they really gotta gotta watch out for in in Fabio's camp. He's probably gonna need to get plastic surgery to get that taken care of, mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise that they're gonna have to surgically repair that because otherwise it's gonna be target practice for anybody with a yeah. strong, strong jab. I mean, you're just gonna try to open that up round one and kind of you know cause that that bleeding and cause that to be an issue. Uh, in the fight, and it obviously was an issue in the fight, as it would be if if anybody's bleeding so so profusely from from the top mm -hmm. of the nose like that. So it's something I think they're going to have to get taken care of. Yeah, he said it's got scar tissue there. You'll probably need that um, taken out. Mm -hmm. Definitely, it's going to keep opening up every mm -hmm. time he gets hit really hard. Yeah, thanks to Nathan Gorman. I think he was the one that started that there, but. <laughs> It was a it was a really good fight. It was nice to see that both of them put that a hundred percent effort in. So they were both exhausted. So you like shouting at that, you know, for, for them to throw more shots, but they just didn't have that energy. And then we saw them start combinations, and then the last one like was a tap, and then they end up hugging each other. That British heavyweight kind of it, it's just beautiful to see. But base, you were there. You were in the mix of it. You was right in the middle of it. What was it like to watch that live? Yeah, it was very exciting. It was, all of it was like on the edge of your seat. And when you saw the uppercuts, especially from, from Frazier mm. early on, they were really impactful, like in, from, from ringside. Like you could, you could really hear them. You could really feel the shot. And every, every time one of them came in, the first thing I'm thinking is, how are you still on your feet? Like, how has this not wobbled you or taken you off of your stride? Like, Wardley's chin is something is something else. His chin, his head, like he's got he's got a different level of punch resistance. That's what I will say. Um, but the problem with this fight, and I I picked Frazier up before the fight to win, um, mm. and I was even I was even predicting eleventh uh, round uh, stoppage. Okay. But the reason. I think Frazier didn't win this fight. Obviously, outside there's the point and the, the knockdown or whatever, but I still had him winning on my card. But the issue is he he's hasn't got more than two gears. So he's very good at controlling distance and controlling the jab. Those first four rounds, he boxed beautifully, he was timing, timing Fabio, you know, very sharp on the on the on the jab. The backhand was coming in, everything was brilliant. And then as soon as Fabio decided, okay, do you know what? Screw trying to trying to mess about. Let's up the tempo. Frazier was all at sea. It's like he doesn't he doesn't have the ability to go to, to go up and down in the gears. He has to stay in one and two. And if he goes up to third, he's almost like he drops off of a cliff all the way down to one before he can just about kind of get going again. And that's why in the later rounds, when Fabio looked almost out on his feet half the time, Frazier will throw one shot. And then there's no follow up, and then he just sort of he'd fall in because obviously he hasn't got the energy to do two and three punch combinations. But it's like the first shot's not going to take him down. You need to know at this point you need to put that second shot in. You need to put that third shot in, and that's why in a lot of the later rounds, like especially rounds ten and eleven, Fabio, even though he was getting beat up in those rounds, he won them at the very end because he was able to put punches together. He was able to affect Frazier by when Frazier's trying to block one and two, there's a third one, the fourth one coming in, and there's a fifth one. And if he could work on his conditioning to be able to, you know, to go up and down in those gears as and when necessary, he'd be, he'd be much better. But at this current one pace note that he's got, he's, he, he will come unstuck against people either like Fabio with who've got that heart and the ability to up the tempo or against people with just better overall boxing ability than him 
Um, but yeah, like I predicted Frazier to win. I thought he did win it. I had it eight rounds to four with the two point deduction. So 112, 114 to him. But the 113, 130, and I couldn't really argue with. What I would like to see is the actual scorecards themselves because the way that they mm -hmm. were given tells me that only one point was deducted from Frazier based on those two scorecards, unless okay. there was a couple of draw rounds. But I need to, I'd need to see it. Yeah, probably there were a couple of draw rounds, I bet. But yeah, we probably do need to see those scorecards. Um, Maestro, a lot of people, and I think base, you probably can jump in on this. Mm. One of the things that was, what? why did you pick Fraser to win when everyone was, you know, more or less saying that Fabio would win? He was, we can only go off what we see. So mm. what made you think, you know what, he's going to be the one to come through this? I've been in the gym with him I'm quite lucky so I've seen him spar so I knew the stuff that he was practicing I knew what he was ready to do I knew how hard he'd been training so that's what when I was speaking to Dillian I was saying to him but the work that Fraser's been putting in because he's taking his fight serious you can't really you sound like you're writing him off and it was it was like everyone just like dismissed him but you didn't you were saying you predicted him to win why yeah because he's Obviously, he's the better fundamental of the two. He's got a very hard jab. He's not the heaviest of hitters, but he hits hard enough. And he's got a good 20 pounds on him. So I was thinking, well, okay. if he manages the first five rounds, first five, six rounds, just manages the distance, like boss Fabio up to the point he's now got to rush in, which is basically what happened round five and round six, then you maybe you use your weight to to take a bit more out of him, especially if he's a very fast twitch, explosive guy. Generally speaking, those type of people take more out of the gas tank to, to throw their attacks. Whereas if you're a bit more sort of just big and naturally more lumbersome, you can you can hold a bit of energy back. That's the way I was looking at it. And I felt his he would be able to keep his construct and keep his and keep his defensive shape well enough to be able to sustain any momentary attacks and then get back to boxing then when it's really tired either take it over down the stretch or make it more comfortable that's how i was looking at it interesting what do you think my shot who did you have winning going uh, into it i i had it a, essentially a 50 50 fight that i was just very excited to see um and really it was tough for me to pick a winner because just looking at Fraser Clark's professional pedigree, let's be honest. I mean, there's not really much there, or at least there wasn't going into this fight. I mean, we it, it's tough to, for me at least, to pick a guy based on those performances. I mean, it's not like he was spectacularly, you know, destroying people on his way up. I mean, and the guys that he did get out of there, like in his debut... I mean, you could argue that Fabio Wardley was facing tougher competition than that when he was in his uh, white collar fights. The, the, the guy that Fraser Clark made his debut again was really, I, I was the audience. embarrassed for him to be making his debut uh, against a guy like that. But what I will say is this, it, it, it speaks a lot to, and we were talking about this before the show started, the, the fan base in the UK that guys can have lucrative careers fighting at this level and uh, filling arenas or partially filling arenas for these kind of domestic fights. Because when I look at where these guys are within the heavyweight division, I, I don't think they're on the level of a, of a, a, a G Caballo, who's the European champion. Okay. Um, I don't at all. I think a G Caballo beats both of these guys um, quite easily. Actually. Uh, I don't see him them on the level of, of a Frank Sanchez, who, by the way, is younger than Fraser Clark. Allegedly. Um, you yeah, know. Allegedly. Well, people, people, <laughs> is he people, like the, people, people like to say that, but this is my, my, my thing to people who say that as someone who's actually been to Cuba and has uh, relatives in Cuba. Uh, Cuba, the Cuban government doesn't forge passports and forge birth certificates. I don't know what kind of country they think Cuba is, but Cuba is a serious country. It no, it's it that it, it doesn't stem up, from the Cuban hold government. Up, hold up. It does. Because it. it does because these are guys who competed for Cuba internationally and would have needed 
to go to Aiba tournaments. Now it's no longer Aiba, Aiba, it's IBA, but on Cuban government documents, including passports. I mean, what are they just going to show up in places like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and China and and yeah, but Maestro, Maestro, on, you're on, forgetting on, these on false documents. Look, but a, they don't they don't get their documents when they when they leave respect, Cuba. They're on boats. With all due respect, with all due respect, what I'm saying is, in the West, people look at other countries and they look at them as if they're beneath the countries that they live in. Oh no, nah. Venezuela like or Cuba or now Russia. No, these are serious places with serious leaders and serious governments that produce real government documents. But I digress. The point is, the point Did is... Did you look than he is? That's what I was thinking about. I wasn't thinking about yeah, no do. documentation. And, but Lara doesn't look old for his age, does he? And Erislandi Lara fought, fought on Saturday as well. No. Mar Maurizio Lara looks a lot older than he is as well. Yeah, yeah. So... Th there you go. And there were other people as well. E even Ismael Barroso looks way older th than, than it is. But there's guys in the U.S. that look way older than, than they are. Look, the point is, Frank Sanchez on paper, and people can dispute his age if they want, <laughs> he's, young, he's younger than these guys, and he whoops both of these guys, in my opinion. Um, then you got other guys in the division, uh, like, like Jalalov, right? Jared uh, Anderson? Jared Anderson being another. So the thing is, in the United States, there's no U.S. title that, you know, people competing yeah. against each other for a U.S. title. Like, that's not going to fill an arena. Even guys shame, competing though. for Continental America's title, which used to be bigger than it is today, uh, that's not going to fill an arena. So these guys are very fortunate, and it's the credit to the U.K. fight fans that guys fighting at this level can be on a big TV platform and be in a big arena and do this because... I'm telling you, once these guys leave that level, uh, I don't see a, a very bright, bright future for either of them as far as I'm concerned. I don't know. What, what do you think about that base? I think I think that Fraser will be all right. I think that he's, yeah, he's got, he's got work to do. All right, in what sense? But I just think that he could probably mix it up with some of those guys later on, maybe in a couple of years' time. I know there's the age concept about Fraser because he started, he turned over late because he was in, I think he did two terms on uh, GB before he got his bronze medal. Um, but you've got to think about it. Fabio is in a position now where he can walk away from the belt and he is circling around those guys and then he can leave the belt for Fraser to have as, I don't know, as a vacant to challenge somebody else in the UK. But what, when you're looking at, you're saying Ajit is like European level, that's potentially where Fabio Wardley is going to go mm -hmm. next. That's that's the potential step for him. And I you're saying that that's straight away gets demolished? Factor. Sorry, what did you say, Karma? I think this fight was the deciding factor which one will move up in levels. And it wasn't really decided. I mean, I'm going to preface this with on paper again, because I know these things are all in dispute. But on paper, Martin Bacoli is younger than Fabio Wardley and is just a year old. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, I meant in Fraser Clark and is a year older than Fabio oh, Wardley. On, on paper, on paper, Philip Hergovich is younger than Fraser Clark, you know? So again, l luckily for them, they had this little rivalry. It did mm. good business for them. It, it did good numbers. But when I look at like the top 10, top 15 heavyweight rankings, I mean, it's difficult for me to make a case that either Fabio Wardley or Fraser Clark are going to be in contention for heavyweight title. Number one, and it's debatable, even though Fabio Wardley still has that WBO European title. That's not actually the European title, as I know all of you know. Mm. The EBU title is. I, I don't see him beating the real European champion. So it's I I'd be interested that. to hear from you where you guys think that these guys are gonna be going uh in the in the heavyweight division, domestically or or beyond. Bryce. No, look, I've given my assessments on on Frazier and Fabio numerous times before. This is maybe I reckon 
fringe European is is the I think Frazier's ceiling is probably fringe European, and I think Fabio's ceiling is in and around that same area. Like, or you can you can have some very good fights against either other domestic or maybe European competition that don't have the belts, or even American competition, lower level ones. Like, uh, obviously, you had the Michael Coffey fight, which I still feel was stopped way too early, and Coffey was actually winning that fight for me. But you can have it against those kind of people, like Stephen or Stephen Shaw, and, you know, maybe the Cassius Cheneys, and you maybe have competitive fights in, in that level, in sort of the, you know, the top 30, and they can be solid sort of top 30, top 20 maybe top 25 guys but outside of that um i would be very surprised if either of them got to that world title level unless it was a voluntary shot and someone would just wanted to have a, a, a british you know just wanted to come to england to fight and that was just who was available um but i also reckon they could probably i mean fabio's already done it go to saudi and get a big bag over there in a in a very you know high high energy domestic level bout or, or a fight with some needle in it so they're both going to have good careers but they're just not in my opinion going to do anything you know exemplary uh, mm. that's that's how i see it okay let me just go through this chat and i've got to do the super chats um ring iq boxing talk uh one dollar 99 here to harass karma he then throws in another 4.99 spence doc uh spence doc bod Rematch to fight Southpaw Slenderman Kame. I've seen him going wild on his lives at two o'clock in the morning. They're usually running in YouTube, and then I hear him screaming. And I wake up uh, to hear him shouting down the mic on his lives. Sly tendencies. Did anyone see the judge in the Rolly Pitbull fight who had Rolly ahead? Bad judging, and will always be boxing's eternal black eye. Um, let's have a look and go down some of the chat some more. Hey, folks, first time on your live. Welcome to you. Uh, Fabio's nose is always cut and scabbed over. Yeah, somebody mm. mentioned that, and I said that they must have airbrushed a poster. Uh, Fabio does need to get that scar tissue fixed. I'm going to fly down through the chat. Let's have a look. Um EJ saying it's because Fraser doesn't do his road work and he ran out of gas. He does. He's, he's doing quite a bit of running because a lot of people were saying that he was going to gas halfway through, that he's never done the rounds before. Um, but I know that those guys have been putting in um, the road work. Um, Tony's saying 100% agree with base. Neither fighter has his intensity levels for top level fighting. God, there's so much chat to go through. Sorry, guys, I won't be able to cover um, all of it, but we've had another super chat come in from Nando Lamas, who's just popped in $4.99 um, without saying anything. So thank you to you. Uh, Fabio needs surgery ASAP. And then we've got a couple of hellos from each other. Um, I'm going to go over to you guys now and let you run the show when it comes to Team Zoo and uh, Fondora. All of that stuff there, because like I said, I've been a bit naughty. I've been chilling with the family and I haven't caught up on these fights. So anybody want to jump on that first? And that's going to be a live show. And I'll just I'll just keep running through the chats here. I can I can, uh, I can do an introduction of it. Um, do, do, do. I, the stage so is yours. Karma, you guys can jump in. So, look, this was a big event, supposedly, here in the United States, because the PBC, uh, an organization that is confusing to some um, because it's kind of a hybrid thing between kind of a PR agency and an advisory group. And they oftentimes act as promoters, even though they're not officially promoters. They work uh, with people with promoters licenses like Tom Brown to put on events. Uh, they essentially lost their last TV distributor here in the United States, Showtime, when Showtime decided to leave the sport of boxing. And there were rumors that potentially they may go to the zone or potentially they may go to Paramount Plus, which is another streaming platform. And they landed on Amazon Prime. Uh, this fight, which happened literally on the second last day, the penultimate day of March of 2024, was their first card under this agreement and their first card of 2024. 
So essentially three full months went by in 2024 with no PBC boxing. Um, and this was the first event. It was supposed to be Keith Thurman facing Tim Zhu in a catchweight fight of 155 pounds, not for Tim's title. Uh, why that was on pay-per-view, I have no idea because 2023, if you remember, was supposed to start with Tim Zhu fighting Jermel Charlo for all of the belts on regular Showtime, not on pay-per-view, for all of the belts. Flash forward a year in three months, and we're getting a fight at a catch weight for no belt being put on pay-per-view. Well, Keith Thurman suffers a bicep tear a little bit over a week uh, before the fight, and they pull uh, – Sebastian Fundora, the towering inferno, six foot six, fighting at 154 pounds, coming off of a brutal knockout loss uh, in a WBC interim title fight against Brian Mendoza in his first fight back. Now he's been pulled off the undercard up to the main event, and um, he's taking on Tim Zhu for the vacant title, uh, WBC title, and for Tim Zhu's title at 154. So it's no longer a catchweight fight. Uh, that was kind of the event. Rowley's fighting uh, on the undercard against Pitbull Cruz in his first title defense since a very controversial win over Ismael Barroso in his last fight. Uh, we had er uh, Erislandi Lara on the undercard coming back, defending his title, uh, uh, you know, against Michael Zarafa, also from Australia. So it, it was a very competitive card. I don't think it should have been on pay-per-view at all. It was on pay-per-view. And then, of course, what happens, something that I can't explain, and I'm going to let you guys jump in right now, Tim Zhu sustains a terrible gash, not a cut, a gash on his forehead. Looked like they hit a vein because it was gushing blood. Uh, this this is in the second round. He hit an elbow, a uh, sharp elbow. Fedora's elbows have got to be sharp. He's got no body fat, essentially. 6'6", six, six, fighting at 154. There's very little flesh between that elbow and, and the skin. Uh, busts open a huge gash. And for whatever reason, Tim Zhu's corner let this go past four rounds. You see, after four completed rounds, they have to go to the scorecards. If they stopped the fight before the four rounds, it would have been a no contest, which would have also been fine for Tim Zhu. They let it go past four. At worst, had it gone four, Tim Zhu would have ended up with a draw. But he ended up fighting eight, nine, ten full rounds without essentially being able to see. Uh, one of Tim Zhu's best uh, attributes is his ability to block and parry and slip shots and counter with hard jabs and right hands. He couldn't do that half the time because he was wiping blood from in front of his face because he was blinded by his own blood. They, they did a terrible job. Uh, in that corner. The fight should have been stopped. They should have made it clear to the referee and to the doctor that he couldn't see. Yes, he's a warrior. Yes, he wants to compete. But look, medically, like, come on, guys, we got to stop this fight. And I was disappointed seeing that happen. But um, that's what happened in the main event. And we can talk about the undercard as well, if you guys want as well. I agree. They should have definitely stopped it. Um, that gash, there was no way in the corner. I don't care who you got stitched around. There was no way they would have been able to stop that bleeding. It was too big. It's not a, that wasn't a cut. Like you said, it was a gash, and they definitely should have stopped that fight. Yeah, I mean, look, the if I was him personally, I know that his trainer is his uncle. Uh, but yeah, I, I might have to get rid of the whole team if that was me. Because first of all, like to be honest, you have to also say in his own stupid error. He's taken a completely different style matchup on 12 days notice, even though, to be fair, look, he knew he could beat Sebastian and everyone. I think everyone watching knew that he could and should have beat Sebastian, even with blood gushing down his face for 10 rounds. He still lost a split decision. So someone, yeah. so one judge still looked and said, all right, he still put the pause on him when he couldn't see for 10 rounds. He busted up Sebastian Fondora's nose and mouth from the second round on. And you saw Sebastian even looking like, okay, this ain't gonna go the way I was planning. And then, like, yeah, it was it must have been divine intervention for him that 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 he ended up tripping uh, Tzu to fall headfirst into his elbow 
and to cause that big, massive, massive cut. And then, yeah, the team around them, oh, yeah, we can control it, we can control it. And then and then just doing nothing but maybe putting some Vaseline and maybe yeah. some adrenaline on it the whole time. It's like, from the if I was, if I saw him, even in, because the, the third round, obviously now all of a sudden, the way that he was fighting, he's no longer fighting that same way. He's wiping blood. He's getting hit with this jab that he wasn't getting hit with in the first two rounds. Okay, clearly something's wrong. That's what I'm going to look at. And then we're going to say, all right, what's the chances that we can get to him to, to knock him out now? After that round, you say to yourself, oh, do you know what? Mm, all right, cool. We'll give you Maybe we'll give you one more round. Fourth round comes, exact same thing happens. I would be calling the ref for saying, oh, you can't see. We've got to stop this fight. So that way, even whether it becomes a draw, because he's either going to win the fight or it's going to be a draw, because he definitely won the first yeah. two. And then it's debatable. You want to choose the last two. At absolute worst, it's the draw. WBC still vacant. You keep your title. Get right. that sorted. And you look to run it back like later on down the line. But now you're in a position where you've lost your belt. You obviously now he's gained two belts that he didn't really deserve or earn in the first place. And you're out in the wilderness because you ain't even got a rematch clause. I'm I mean, how saying. how does that happen? 12, 12, fight, 12 days notice and you don't put a rematch clause in your contract. And this is the same reason, the same way if Julius is still in the, the chat, he probably would tell you the same. Like, this is what happens when you start dealing with PBC. Like, you get screwed if you're not one of the affiliated people. Like, whatever they can do to take, to take away your belt or your opportunity, they will do it. And as I'm much as he thought... Like, he, I'm th I don't discount that base but here's the thing they could have dealt with all of that with proper management and proper corner work no they could have proper management could have insisted on a rematch clause right and proper corner work would have insisted through conversation with the referee look and the doctor look we can't stop this cut and it's bleeding into his eyes it is unsafe for him to continue Worst case scenario, think about this. What if he had been brutally knocked out? Yeah. What if it was a, a career-changing, uh, life-changing, brutal knockout because it, he had blood in his eyes? Now we're not just talking about his inability to get a big fight. We're talking about long-term health issues. It, it, they, they did a disservice in negotiating the contract to Tim, to Base's point, and they did a disservice to... Uh, maintaining his his professional standing in the sport and his health in the corner by not insisting that the fight be stopped. There's all of that, but that also being said, look, we don't we know there's not a rematch clause because Samson Lukovic was quite said, so, well, no, we could definitely do the rematch and it's there, but he, he have to have another fight. He got to build himself and blah blah blah. To be honest, we don't know ultimately how the the contract negotiation was initially because he's not one of their people so obviously they're gonna do what they're gonna do to to maybe put him in a position that he wants because he wants to fight on american tv he wanted to fight in vegas that was his big thing they were the ones that offered him that opportunity said so maybe there were certain things provisos put in the contract to say well this is the this is the stipulations it's either you take it this way or you go back to australia which he didn't want to do i don't know but yes, you're totally right. Management was poor. Whether that's him being too bold of it, oh, well, you know what? It's just another fight. Oh, I'll get rid of him. Look how Mendoza did it. Look how I beat Mendoza. So I've got him triangle theory. Might have thought that. And maybe he got overconfident. But then, as you said, the team themselves should have said, okay, no, let's, we're going to save this belt and we'll do, we'll rematch it when we've got a full camp under our belts. And yeah. then we can see what what happens next but yeah now he's got no uh he's he's got no rematch clause the best thing he can possibly hope for is that um sebastian fundora decides that he's gonna face errol, errol spence the wbo belt's gonna get stripped away and because um crawford is the mandatory maybe they may say well even though josh kelly's the number one challenger uh we saw what happened in that fight we'll allow you to fight for the vacant title against Crawford. That's that's the best thing he can hope for right now outside of having to fight his way back into back into contention. Well, he's going to have to fight his way back anyway because if you fight Crawford, I definitely don't see him winning that fight. So he's 
screwed all no, around. No, but at least he'd have a belt. At least he'd have a, a title shot. <laughs> so you know what I mean? Nah, yeah. <laughs> but he'd get one soon, though. But no, uh, there's that. It's so yeah, but that's pretty much all, all we really. Everyone knows, like, if it wasn't for the cut, like, uh, Fondura was on his way out after three, four rounds because he was already badly busted up. Um, Isaac, Isaac Cruz, and Roly Romero. I mean, that was total destruction. As we, ex I think every, I don't think anyone with common sense gave Roly Romero a prayer win in that fight, and then him gloating about, oh, you know, well. I wanted to, I want to build something on Prime because who knows anything about the zone and rare rare rare. Okay, cool. Well, you know, everyone on Prime who bothered to, to pay for it just watched you get get Bambi legged from round one all the way through to round eight. And you go you went from being a main event, probably earning at least four, three or four million, to being on the undercard, probably earning about seven hundred thousand. And that's your team that did that for you, but they've got your best interests in heart. All right, cool. I, I agree with that base. The thing is, though, I don't think Roley was in a position to be able to accept the deal from the zone. I mean, uh, he signed the Mayweather promotions. Uh, the front man for that at this point is um, Leonard Ellerby, uh, who has pretty much never said anything positive about the zone, even though Floyd has fought exhibition fights on the zone. Um, I think it's, it, it's going to sound maybe a little crazy for me to say this, but I don't actually blame Roley for the fact that that fight uh, didn't take place. I, at the end of the day, if you have a promotional contract uh, and the promoter doesn't want to release you from that contract to be able to fight on a rival network, unless it's like a purse bid situation that the promoter lost or, or, or something like that, uh, I don't know if there's much he could do about that. Um, no, I agree with you. But yeah. here's what I'm saying. He's he's so stupid that rather than keeping quiet about it, like he's actually going to make it a much bigger thing. When we look at it, because at yeah. the end of the day, if you remember, if you're, you went on an interview and said, well, I picked a harder fight for less money and people are criticizing me. Are you like, how stupid do you have to be to say that? To admit that you've actually just taken a harder fight for less money you should have probably just kept quiet and said you know this is you know this is who was the this was who i had to fake face or whatever you or you keep quiet you don't speak but him doing what he's done and then all the trashing of the other platform afterwards just makes him look even stupider now is is basically my point yeah i i, I understand that i was just making the point that i don't think he was in a position to uh accept any offer that was might may or may not have been given to him probably was given him through golden boy uh to fight on on the zone and you know his response was probably he him not understanding why he was being criticized for taking a harder fight for less money because he's like aren't you guys always saying that we should just be fighters and fight for you know whatever whatever now i'm being criticized but yeah it didn't come across very good but let's also not forget that he did not deserve to even have this title in the first place. Yeah, he got gifted uh, the title. He was losing that fight comprehensively to Ismail Barroso. He was knocked down by Ismail Barroso. And at the first sign of even a little bit of threat uh, that he posed to, to Barroso, Tony Wee stops the fight, like, out of nowhere. I mean, <laughs> it, was the, it was the most insane stoppage I've seen. I mean, obviously, it's it's recency bias here, but I can't think of a worse stoppage that I've seen uh, uh, of a fight. And, you know, to base his point, rather than capitalize on essentially being gifted a title, he ended up forking over that title in the most embarrassing way. His post-fight interview was obviously very cringe. Um, I, you know, I don't necessarily like guys being forced into interview positions once they've just been beating up like that um so i felt that was a little bit i mean he clearly wasn't in a position to give a post-fight interview but even that made everything worse uh so look isaac has got the title at 140 uh unfortunately for those of you who are would like to see a fight between isaac and matias or isaac and haney or isaac and teofimo i don't really see isaac fighting any of those guys i think that what they'll probably do is try to do a rematch with Tank for Isaac's full title at 140 uh, after, you know, in, in 
they're probably expecting Tank to beat Frank Martin when they face each other in June, and then we'll get Izak versus Tank too. But I, unfortunately, I don't see unification fights in the future of uh, Izak Pitbull Cruz. Well, what about you guys? Tank is gonna be next up. I don't you, think so. We know the play. We know the PBC playbook. You think so? I don't now, think now they, so. Cause, yeah, because they've been, he's been talking. Isak's been talking about the rematch for the longest amount of time. So if Tank's gonna go up to one forty, uh, he's only gonna go up there against someone he knows he can quote unquote beat. He's already beat him, but now the rematch maybe does more money than it did before, and he gets a legit new belt out of it. And he can he can have the WBA and both one forty and one thirty five. <laughs> I mean, That's the point. is my is my old Barroso is the interim champion? Um, because that he, has he, to be next. He, he, October Reds boy uh, O'Hara Davies in his last fight, you know. So <laughs> I just <laughs> I just wanted I just wanted to see a, 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 a funny face or reaction from October, and I got it. But uh, <laughs> uh, O'Hara Davies got blasted by Ismail Barroso in his last fight. Ismail Barroso holds the interim title. But here's what I said, and I said this to, to my brother Joe Habib, who I mentioned previously. Um, I almost feel like these interim titles and these W, uh, in this case, the, they're like placate, placating belts. Like, okay, yeah, we're not giving you the shot you deserve, uh, but here's this little belt for you to hold on to for a little bit of time while we get let the guy that that that's the cash cow that we want to pull sanctioning fees from do whatever the hell he wants. So I don't think Ismail's going to get the shot. Unfortunately, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I don't think Ismail's going to get the shot he deserves at this title. And they're essentially going to let Pit Pitbull Cruz do whatever he wants with this with this full version of the title at 130, uh, sorry, at 140. I don't um, think he'll do whatever he wants. I think yeah. he'll do whatever the best interest of the PBC. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Let me just catch up on some of the chat. Rolly Pulse fight interview was bizarre. I think I've, I watched a little bit of it. It just seems like he might have been slightly concussed. I think it's safe to say, um, yeah. due to the the you know the savage beatings that he got. Uh, Skyliner, the editor, Mayweather Promotions has a poor track record. Weeks needs to retire. Run A. I still remember Rolly getting a gift against uh, Jackson, Jackson Marines. Yes, yep. So we're going really far back there. Rolly Marrero might have CTE. <laughs> Seems to be the, one of the buzzwords in boxing at the moment. Pugilism. Been saying since Pitbull tank fight. And even though Gio uh, Cabrera fight, Pitbull is official goods and has the armadillo guard uh, that's tough to peel and uh, is shook and crack at. Mm-hmm. I actually thought uh, Cabrera did pretty well in that fight, October. Yeah. Uh, okay. Cabrera being the Freddie Roach uh, fighter. Um, yeah. It was on the undercard of Spence Crawford. Um, that was a fight I think could have gone either way, uh, personally. So I actually mm -hmm. thought that Pitbull's improved in his in his last performance, although Pitbull's way more limited than Gio Cabrera is. Uh, yeah, very okay. much so. I actually yeah. thought Cabrera won that fight. Mm hmm the business, the business of boxing didn't do his job that night. I think he could have been more marketable. I don't know. Um, Kenny's uh, Kenny Porter's right hand salute to Queen Karma Serene. Uh, Queen Cruz is never special. He's reckless. Reckless. Uh, Pugilism comes in. Matthias has the style and Tank has the style to get Pitbull off his game in different ways. Matthias can shook and peel the guard while Tank is more versatile with positioning and timing. That name suits you very well. Pugilism, some beautiful detail in there. Tank Martin might not be as straightforward as we're thinking. Interesting. Isaac is going to be put on the shelf before Tank decides to move up to 140. Um, yeah, <laughs> PBC, where the careers go to disintegrate. Listen, the these are the opinions of the viewers and not the panel. Um, shout out, what is it? Shout out, old face killer. I don't know, is that someone in the chat? Or maybe I need to work on this wrinkle cream. Isaac oh, just shook mean? up the division uh, because all of his opponents that want that fandom exposure also. Um, let's have a look. 
Old oh, Faith Kid is uh, Barroso, by the way. Okay. I mean, he Go is ahead. exactly that. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about the undercard, but I could give a brief um, rundown of, of the other two fights. Uh, Erislandi Lara obliterated Michael Zarafa uh, by second round one punch knockout. Um, he, he's 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 actually been quite the puncher since moving up to 160 pounds. Um, it's going to be interesting to see whether or not he gets any kind of a unification fight. I feel it's weird that Danny Garcia has been calling him out at 160 um, and then kind of wanting the fight to be at a catch weight of 155 because, as he puts it, he wants to be a three-division champion. Well, he won titles at 140 and 147, so you'd think he'd be trying to get a title at 154, but instead he's been calling out Lara for a catchweight fight to become a three-division champion fighting for a 160 belt at 155. A little bit odd, and I actually like Danny Garcia, and I'm in the minority in that I like Angel Garcia as well, but I think that it's quite the odd move. Um, and then Julio Cesar Martinez uh, won by a 12-round uh, split decision, or majority decision, I should say, against Angelito. Angelino Cordova, who's an Argi um, a Venezuelan fighter, uh, that was for the 112 pound championship with the WBC. So those were the two other card uh, fights on the on the main portion of the undercard. And then in the off TV fight, uh, Mendoza ended up losing, um, which we already talked about. With his face looking lopsided at the end of the fight. Yeah. We can't forget that. that. That's a very important detail. Have you seen the pictures? Um, no. October. Okay. Yeah. yeah his, face, his, yep. his, his cheeks like halfway out here. Yeah. On oh, the wow. left hand side. Yeah. That's the jaw gone then. Not quite the level of Hasim Rahman, if you guys remember that fight where Rahman uh, was really, I can't even say bruised up, like a huge contusion. But yeah, he had a huge contusion as well on his on his cheek. So it was the weekend for facial brutality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Guys, talk what about, about Friday the... real quick? Yeah, just yeah, yeah bro. Bro. Yeah, go. Yeah, I was, at, start. I, yeah was, I was at the court in, in Glendale, California. Um, and uh in the main event, uh actually, why don't we start with the co feature? Um because in the co-feature, it was the minimum weight undisputed championship being contested between uh, Yocasta Valle and yeah. uh, Denise Estrada. That was for undisputed. And 12, sorry, I'm so used to saying 12. Oh, no, uh, it's 10, 10. 10 very uh, exciting rounds. Um, a lot of the crowd felt that uh, Yocasta won. Um, but... Uh, Watching it on TV, and also anybody who was up close there ringside could see that the cleaner work was really la landed by by Sinisa Strass. Yeah. Um, and she really put on a top-tier performance, establishing her herself as one of the most talented uh, female fighters in the sport. I think the challenge for her is going to be finding opponents because there's a huge gap in... in um, kind of talent and competition uh, between the very low end of the sport and then once you get up to, like, again, 130, 135, 140, 147 pounds, dare I say up to Clarissa's uh, weight classes, like in the middleweight range. So there aren't a lot of marquee matchups for her in the very low weight divisions. One of them, though, might be uh, Gabriela Fundora, yeah. uh, uh, Seb Sebastian Fundora's uh, sister. Yeah who actually has, has a title mm -hmm. yep, yep, in, in the lower weight division. So, Sinisa, I spoke to her after the fight. Her plan is to move up. And I spoke to Bob Arum about it as well. And Bob Arum's thing was, look, I don't really... He admitted it. I don't really know many of these fighters, uh, the female fighters. Um, but, you know, he's going to have the top-ranked team obviously look into setting up something big for uh, Sinisa Estrada on... Um, on the top rank card. So uh, that was that. And then in the uh, main event, and uh, this is embarrassing. I, I was asked to give an interview right before the fight happened by a local uh, TV 
station. I hope it didn't go out because I accidentally called Liam Wilson, Liam Walsh in my response. You guys remember, might remember Liam Walsh. He's another fighter altogether that fought Tank Davis. It was a slip of the tongue. Uh, but Liam Wilson, and I didn't realize this until later on, was essentially saying that he needed a knockout to win in Glendale. Um, he didn't think that he could get a fair shake on the cards. And in my eyes, had he stuck to a game plan of essentially using his his length, his jab, and boxing on the outside, he would have potentially won a unanimous decision. I thought he was doing quite well when he was boxing and using his physical attributes. But he took the decision to fight Valdez on the inside he took the decision to hook with Valdez, to trade up a cuts and hooks with Valdez. And I remember turning to the person beside me, at, I think it was around round four, I'm saying, this guy's going to get himself knocked out fighting like this. And lo and behold, uh, that's what happened in the seventh round. He got TKO'd, um, and and the, the rest is history. So Valdez is now the... Uh, interim 130 pound champion that's important because the full champion with the wbo at 130 is navarrete navarrete is moving up in his next fight to fight for the vacant title at 135 should he win and stay there um valdez gets elevated to under uh, sorry to full full champion at 130 with the wbo and at that point we might get to see him face a guy like an oshaki foster uh, who's also signed to top rank. Uh, and that 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 would be quite an interesting and exciting fight. I, I personally don't think Navarrete is going to move back down. His move up to 135 confuses me because he literally just won a title at 130. Um, mm. But maybe he's struggling to make the weight. Maybe he doesn't want to spend the extra time training to make the weight. I don't know. But Valdez is the interim titleist now. And it sets up a fight, a unification fight, between him and Oshaki Foster, Shock Foster, should Navarrete decide to stay up at 135. Face Gulamarian. Yeah. Um thank you, Maestro, for for obviously that with um Sanisa via and everything. Just a quick one on that. Yeah, I think Sanisa's definitely moving up. She ain't staying at one one oh five. And I think she needs to because her power doesn't seem to be carrying the way it used to. I think she's struggling to make the weight. Um, but yeah, uh, she won't be facing. <laughs> there no way they're going to put her against Gabriela Fondora. That, that's that may be a, a, a task too too tall. Uh, probably a Reddy Massino might be a a, a potential um, fight for her. Anyway, yeah. So Gunamarian and uh, Zerda Ramirez. To me, I thought this was a very, very good performance by Zerdo. Um, I used to be very critical of him basically fighting a lot of C plus and B minus level opposition, uh, having having a very sort of padded record. He had some good names on the record, but you know there was never really anyone that tested him or stretched him until he faced Bivol. But since the Bivol loss, I've actually been quite impressed with his abilities in these two quote-unquote cruiserweight fights the first catchweight one and now this proper one whereby he's actually boxing and moving he's he's boxing on the move he's boxing off the off the pivot he's boxing behind a smart lead hand and he's also still got the ability especially as he showed in this good American fight to be in the ring with bigger guys box in the pocket outland them outpunch them now yes obviously good American is not the the quickest of opposition but he's the kind of guy that gets going as the fight goes on. So those first couple of rounds, obviously very sharp from Ramirez, but then, yeah, he's just stayed with him and he just kept kept tagging him, never looked hurt, never looked um, panicked in, in the pocket. It just was a very competent performance for me. And he's gone up in my estimations from where I used to have him. Um, and I think, to be honest, I think the loss has actually helped his career because before it's almost like he was intentionally trying to protect that O. Now that O is gone, it's almost like he's boxing a bit freer. Free. <laughs> and while he may not have the, he may not have been facing the. Technically, you might say he was facing the worst, or at least the most inactive 
cruiserweight champ, but he was facing a legit champ. Yeah. And yeah. he beat him comprehensively. Um, yeah, and just outlanded the uppercut. The, the outside uppercut, the inside slipping, riding, rolling. I was just really impressed with his performance. And yeah, I uh, hope it continues. And hopefully we get a unification next or the fight after next. I think the move up in weight has helped him as well. I don't see how we couldn't have because the fact that somebody with that frame and he carries the 200 pound yeah, plus very well, the mm -hmm. fact that he was making 168 where he He's won not. his first world title is insane. Even that he was making 175, to be honest, how he had anything <laughs> left in his in his system to to be competitive in those weight classes after essentially making those dramatic weight cuts uh, is 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 quite incredible. So I think that move up in weight has also helped him. With and he looks fat. Oh yeah, the movement. He he looks to be honest. He does look a bit fleshy at 200. Like maybe 200 is a bit too much. Like if it was a 190. I think he'd be perfect if that was the cruiserweight limit. But he yeah. he's also, because he's, again, he's not necessarily a body beautiful kind of guy. Maybe that fleshiness helps him a bit with energy and stamina because there's more, you know, body fat to kind of build off of and, and go through the round right. with. As to when you're like really swollen and muscly and there's nothing for the, you know, the muscles to feed off and whatnot. So, yeah, yeah, I think, I think maybe he should try and come in a little bit less than, the 200 uh just aesthetically for himself but he does carry he does carry it uh, better than some people i give him that he also never really had that kind of a cut up physique even when he mm -hmm. was at 168 or at 175 um genetically he's just not like that um i did want to ask you guys something though about 130 real quick because valdez won what is going on with joe cordina um you guys out there in the uk is it on that for him to pursue a unification fight? Is it to uh no, he's 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 just he only cares about money right about now. Vacation. He said he's just looking for for big money fights. He's facing Anthony Kakache from Queensbury on the uh Usyk um Fury oh. undercard, oh. and then probably after that fight, he'll end up moving up and look for those big money fights at 135, maybe should call Stevenson or something. But he's he's pretty much said if because he couldn't he didn't get the Oh, Shaki Foster unification when he wanted it. He said all he's caring about is big money fights to secure his family. So that's pretty much it. Okay. Guys, have you just seen this? Uh, Tony, the Pugilist, shout out to you. The WBO have now officially ordered Sebastian Fandora to defend his WBC and WBO Super Welterweight World Titles versus Terence Crawford next parties have until the April the 25th to agree a deal then it goes to purse bids. Yeah, I've seen that. That fight's not going to happen, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think it's going to Even if it does go to purse bid, whatever is bid on that is not going to generate enough money for Terrence Crawford. He's not going to do that. I, I, not because I don't think he can win the fight. I think he absolutely wins that fight. I just don't think that it's going to pay him the kind of money that's going to keep him motivated for these fights right now. Um, hence why well, he's talking about Canelo. Do you know what? The thing is, I I agree it's not the big fight that he necessarily wants, but if you think about it, mm. it's a it's an easy way to become a four-weight champion for, in his mind. Okay. He may not get 15 million for, but to be honest, look, the, when he was asking 15 million for Tim Zoo, we have to remember Tim Zoo is box office in Australia. Yeah. He's getting a piece of that revenue as well as whatever comes over here. So he probably thinks, well, I can get more on the on the front side because we're getting two different revenue streams of box office. Mm. But with Fondora, you've got to remember America, very tribalistic, as you know, very, you know, everyone's got their own xen uh, xenophobias and whatnot. It's Mexico and it's, you know, African-American. Yeah. It's that it's that dynamic. So it could end up getting built into that. So it's there not, is a potential. Not, but that's the thing. It's not Mexico. He doesn't have a huge fan base. His father's Cuban. Um, yeah, but his mom's Mexican. His, but his mom's Mexican. So he's got some of that Mexican. I mean, look, it, it's potential, isn't it? It's that Hispanic yeah. against African-American. You never know. So maybe they could try and play on that angle. And you know the PBC will do that because that yeah. was their whole thing with Canelo. They wanted to put him in against all of the guys that, that make the big money. That was Floyd's big thing back in the day. And it, it always seems to work. 
but uh, yeah, I don't think it will give him that much. But ultimately, he might just take it to say, "Well, look, this is this is a quick a quick payday for me en route to getting the what I want, which is the Canelo fight." Going back to Zerdo, then, what is do you think is next for him? Because obviously now he's he's got the belt as and he's he's confidently took the belt off the inactive Gulamari. And Gulamarian was a name that has thrown in the mix for our uh, British cruiserweights, such as uh, Richard Riappor, Chris Billiam Smith, probably more Riappor, and uh, yet again another fight that never happens. But now Zerdo's got the belt, he's in the mix. You know, the likes of obviously Jaya Pattaya is going up against um, Bradis. Bradis for their rematch exciting but now this guy's in the mix fair enough we know that Jared Pattaya is like the the demon of the division the the most feared um but we do have to remember that it was definitely a good fight between him and Bradis mm-hmm. so what happens now with the guy the cruise the cruise are mixed but guys we you know we're still waiting to hear a date allegedly what is it June the 15th for CBS and react for now yeah well there's two ways they can go with that. Zerdo, <laughs> if he if he's a cruiserweight, he's obviously he's looked at who's around. He said he wants to be undisputed. He said he wants to be undisputed in, in cruiser and he wants to eventually move up to heavyweight and win a title there. That's what he said is his mantras. Whether that can ever happen, I don't know. But you look at okay, well, if you've got React Poor and Chris Billum Smith, if if CBS were to win that fight. I can see a scenario where Golden Boy offer CBS a chunk of money to come over to the States and feel like that's the easiest option to a unification for them. But on the other hand, we've got Jaya Pattaya fighting in less than four weeks. Uh, No, sorry, about six weeks now, right? He's fighting in Saudi. I'm pretty sure Zerdo has heard of the kind of bags that you get to fight over in Saudi. Oscar has spoken somewhat about he, he ran back some of his comments True. about yeah. Saudi before. I could yeah, see a scenario true. where His Excellency says, all right, do you know what? We've got another belt over here now. Uh, if you guys want to get in on the action, we can have a big unification here in the next, maybe the next Riyadh season, September, October, whatever. You can have a couple of you have your a little fight beforehand. You both win. You have this massive fight, this massive unification here, and you sort of set the set the ball rolling. Obviously, this is all based on if Jai can once again beat um, Maris Bradis and whatever happens between the two after that. But I know Jai wants to be active, and Zerdo, I'm pretty sure, will not turn down the payday of that of that note. Um, so those are his two best options. Um, the one option that doesn't seem to be on the table at the moment is Noel Gavour. Um, and I don't know if he's if he's signed with with Don King or anything at the moment. But if he's not and he's a free agent, maybe that could be a, a quick option for either one because he's got the WBC belt, which most people always seem to lord as the you know the, the glamour the glamour belt in boxing. So th- there's options there as long as they can be as long as they can be done. Um, maybe CBS ends up being the hardest one because you don't want to. He's your he's the only sort of crowning champion you got. So maybe him and Riappo, you want to keep them on your side as much as possible. But all the others are all going to pay to play because the money is there. It's all it's all tough fights. I mean, even the guy who's ranked number one in the WBA, he's been inactive. But the KO doctor is is always given tough fights every time he's fought. I'm talking about Junior Dorticos. Oh. So, yeah, I mean... If, if you're if you're Zurdo, I grew a base. You want to go for the biggest money uh, on the biggest platform for the biggest accolades. And the cruiserweight division has never really been a huge division in the United States. Let's be mm-hmm. honest. Uh, okay. So his best opportunities are probably going to be overseas. Overseas, yeah. Okay, I agree. What what happens if um, Bradis upsets Jaya Pattaya? It's possible. I mean, he broke He's... his he broke his jaw in the last fight, and it he went. Bradis is a really good fighter. It's a wild card. Mm-hmm. I definitely mm-hmm. think is. I'm definitely looking forward to that, guys. Is there any um, other fights that you want to discuss before we close off? Because I wanted to close off on um, Ben Whitaker uh, before we leave. Oh. Just a, a couple of words on what's happened with Ben Whitaker. Is there anybody else that you want to talk about? Because I'm going to end with. 
our light I mean, heavyweight. Biggest, the biggest yeah. fight on the horizon. I don't know if we're going to do another panel discussion before this fight happens. Is obviously the Ryan versus uh, Haney fight set to take place here in New York City on April the twentieth. Mm -hmm. Um, you know that's obviously uh bit been in the media headlines uh what's interesting uh, from what i understand having spoken to people in the industry and kind of getting the pulse of it here in new york the fight's really not selling at the barclays um, wow yeah so that i think that that's pretty interesting um I, the thing is i said when it got announced that i said is this how can this fight sell on the east coast when they're both west coast people the americans yeah. It's a really big place. Like it's not like oh, coming from London to go to Manchester Arena. Like this is this is a free four five hour flight for some people to get from one side to the other. Yeah. So Six it's just sometimes, yeah. There you go. So to me, I always thought it was a strange decision to have two West Coast people with realistically their fan bases more on that West Coast on the mm -hmm. East Coast. And funny enough, I had this argument with with Tony huge of this and he said no well, people of course people are going to travel yeah well it looks like i've been proved right thus far yeah again well the, <laughs> that's the thing i was gonna go but the tickets are crazy um the right. seats i sat it's in the same arena that wilder hellenius was in this i was gonna get the same seats because i only sit in a certain place in a barclays and the seats are like 10 times the amount that i paid for the wilder fight so it's like it's what? not it's not I, I, I mean, here here's the calculation. It's New York City, right? Yeah. It's got a greater metro area if you include Jersey and Connecticut of about twenty million, right? Uh, I just think that they probably banked on the idea that there's more than enough people in the Northeast. You can loop in Boston, you can loop in Philly, you can loop in DC, uh, Jersey, whatever to sell this fight and to base's point it just it hasn't drawn enough interest in local northeast okay. or new york city area fight fans um the reason they didn't put it on the west coast is because they didn't want two pay-per-view fights uh it's within like two weeks of one another yeah. taking place in in vegas uh, which would have been a natural home to, for this fight because obviously Canelo's fighting Munguia in Vegas on May the 7th, which is only two weeks later. Um, mm -hmm. And they didn't want to do two pay-per-views there. And apparently uh, the PBC was putting pressure on their partners uh, at MGM Grand uh, or the MGM Group to not allow a, a, a fight, another big fight to take place so close. No, yeah, I agree with that. But even then, it's like it doesn't have to be Vegas. Remember, he just did a, a decent one in San Francisco the other day. I'm not saying even there, but yeah. there's other places you could you could have that fight. And because ultimately, when they're saying, "Oh, well, two weeks between pay per views," it's still two weeks between pay per views now. Who's yeah. what? The people are choosing right. to go to Vegas right. rather than to go to New York. So yeah. it's the same problem. You've just created more of a dynamic because now people got to travel again. Happened? So, um, but you could have, if you kept that, it on that place, you could have, you, I reckon they could have found somewhere um, outside of Vegas to have that fight and have a bigger crowd or bigger people more likely to travel there from the West Coast, in my opinion. I, I, base, I don't disagree with you. I'm just giving the arguments that were given, uh, even by Haney himself, when he was explaining why, uh, on, on X, why the fight wasn't taking place on the West Coast. And like mm -hmm. to Base's point, his last fight was in the Bay Area at the arena that at the chase center which is where the golden state warriors now play um but yeah and to karma's point they've overpriced these tickets and people are not willing to pay thousands of dollars to sit in the floor area or hundreds of dollars to sit uh in in the in the seating areas of of the barclays which by the way is not as nice a venue to, to to sit as a fight fan as msg in the first place um i've been to multiple fights at the barclays the seating is tighter uh yeah. it, you're also a kind of a uh, slant, a slant mm -hmm. in the angle that kind of just feels uncomfortable um because the area where they built the barclays uh isn't the block itself is is, is kind of constricted so they really had to cram people in there to make it like a 
an NBA uh, arena in terms of the seating capacity. Because honestly, it really should be like a 12,000, 13,000 seater. But instead, it's like a 17, almost 18,000 seater. And it's 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 like sitting on a Ryanair flight. It's like, why are these seats so close? You know? Or uh, I remember from back in my days, I'm like, in the UK, I'm like, I'm never doing this airline again. <laughs> and then they fly you two hours outside of Madrid when you're flying to Madrid or two hours outside of Barcelona. <laughs> you got to take a train to where you want to go anyway. So that that's kind of what this feels like, you know? Mm. Ben Whitaker, I'm going to finish on there because we've been going for nearly two hours. Um, Base, I'm going to go back to yourself uh, just to talk us through that fight. Once again, yet again, Ben Whitaker, damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. You was there. Tell us what you saw. Well, I've had the benefit of not hearing anything uh, about the commentary, but I have heard about it like since. But in the arena, everything that happened was uh, everyone was engaged from the from the ring walk uh, to being in the uh, in the fight. And it's funny. Um, I actually said I was speaking with um, one of one of the, the guys sitting next to me because I think he said, oh, what kind of shenanigans do you think we're going to get today? Uh, and I just said, wouldn't it be funny if he actually knocks this guy out in the first round and, and there's no showboating whatsoever? <laughs> and then lo and behold, he kind of knocks Leon yeah. Williams down first round. You think, oh, maybe that could happen. And then right at the end, obviously, you get a little bit. But people were... Um, People was sort of engaged. Everyone was kind of looking. I had um Big Zoo behind me. He was like, "No, nah, Ben, do a backflip, do a backflip." Then hit him. <laughs> <laughs> he's like just being a being a proper troll. So, um, it, that was quite funny. Um, but yeah, everyone just looked, and then obviously every time that Ben got caught with with anything, whether it was hard or or just like a just a glancing shot, everyone out. Like, I'm almost like, wow, like he, he actually got hit. He actually got hit, and then um. When he did the little, you know, when he was doing the drunken muscle, he got hit and then he acted like he was all wobbly. And that people, some people thought it was being legit. Like, oh, wow, is he really hurt kind of thing. But then I was, I'll quickly realise, okay, no. And then, yeah, it was just one of those ones where every, it looked all, it looked comfortable. Even when he was getting hit in some of the rounds, um, to me, and I said this on my video, it looks like he was like, okay, this guy's hit me. I can't make people think that he's just having a lot of success here. So I've got to do in his mind, quickly thinking, I've got to ham it up to make it look like I'm allowing this to take place. And then after a while, he kind of stopped messing about, got into his bag. And then as soon as he felt comfortable with the pace again, that's when he kind of just went back into, you know, his natural mode. Um, but people, everyone was really, they, they all really enjoyed when he started pointing at the, at the corner. You guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they they all they really they really enjoyed that um but yeah he, there's some shots i think he took which he he maybe at the end will look at and say i should have never got hit with that like i can't you know i might have a chin but i can't just allow people to hit me especially people at this level yeah. um so yeah look it was a good performance i think everyone was a bit um they were disappointed that it didn't end in a knockout but they liked they liked the fight itself and a couple of people around me said well, you know what leon he did well enough that we think he deserves to see the final bell. So that's how some people are looking at it. And I guess maybe now that's almost like a victory to some of these quote unquote journeymen. Can I go the distance with him? I, can I keep my form and keep my shape and not get rattled by what he's doing? Um, but yeah, it was, I, I mean, I enjoyed it as, as I always have. Um, I've always said, as long as he, as long as he continues to do it, I don't, I'm not saying I want him to do copious amounts every fight, but as long as he doesn't, deviate and he just is who he is i'm never gonna have a problem with it and he's being himself so love that i didn't it wasn't the greatest performance of his but it was still very accomplished and i still think he won every single round even the rounds where he got hit he still outlanded and out punched leon so i don't know how he ended up losing any rounds on the the referee scorecard but maybe he was just uh good on you because you got you got one back kind of thing so but yeah i enjoyed it karma I'm a big, big Ben Whitaker fan. I'm glad that he didn't knock him out. I wanted to see him go the full rounds because he got so much flack last time, but I guess it wasn't good enough this time either. Um, good job, Ben. I did want to see what kind of beard he has, and he did get busted a couple of times, but 
he's saying he shouldn't he shouldn't be getting hit but he does need to take a hit to see how he will react when he takes when he gets hit so i mean it, all all positive i have no notes mm-hmm. Marshall. yeah i mean um I, I think i said this last time i've met ben whitaker i like ben whitaker i'm just not a fan of the harlem globe trotters like i've never enjoyed watching those kind of basketball games uh i like watching real basketball games with fundamentals and two competitive teams uh facing off against each other like i don't want to see a, a, the harlem globe trotters against the washington generals and it's like one guy's bouncing the ball off the other guy's head and pulling his shorts down and dribbling him around him and then shooting a half court shot like that's just not entertaining to me I, I've never Sounds been. Sounds to me. I need to I've start never, to watch it. I mean, it to a lot of people it is, which is why the Harlem Gold Trotters remain a robust business and go all over the the world doing like circus uh, style uh, basketball games. Um, my my the reason I don't particularly look a little bit of showboating's entertaining and has always been fun to watch. Uh, Guys doing bolo punches, whether it's Chris Eubank Sr. or Prince Nazim Ahmed. I mean, Joe Calzaghi putting his hands in, behind his back, uh, sticking his chin out against Roy Jones and daring him to to hit him. Like, there's, there's, that's always entertaining. My issue, though, is, and it, it's what I said last time, is when it's, you're doing it against guys who are essentially there to be in uncompetitive matchups, Right. And I'm going to be going to see a guy named um, uh, Richard Rivera next week in Connecticut. Uh, he's a light heavyweight, uh, kind of lower-level contender. He's been on on the zone, I think, in the past. You guys might have seen him. Uh, yeah. Monica, Popeye the he same. He Badu Jack. Yes. Popeye forearms. Popeye, yeah. exactly. So, but he's going back down to his natural. That was at cruiserweight. He's going back down to his natural weight at 175. There's no way that Ben Whitaker is going to do this against a guy of that level. So we are fighting these guys. Work on what you need to work on. You shouldn't be getting hit from people like this because are you going to do that against Dan Aziz, who was there in the audience doing commentary? I don't think so. Um, I wouldn't counsel you to do that. And I was actually, I actually thought that Dan Aziz was really entertaining. I don't know if you went back and I, heard I commentary. didn't hear it but I've, he was I've heard I'm going to listen to it when we finish he was, he was very entertaining um and, somebody and, said once on X that he was quite salty yeah at the at the end of the fight uh he was talking to the to the uh commentator from 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 Sky right and the commentator from Sky was like well you know there there are fighters out there that you just know that they're like genius level and that they can go from essentially genius GCSEs to to uh to PhDs, you know, and and be able to do that. And you know, we found out tonight that Ben Whitaker can't make that jump. Uh that's what the you guy from that? the guy said. I, I don't know. It was oh, it was wow. it, it wasn't it wasn't my man Andy. It was whoever does the, the commentary. So then uh, is my, my goes, then, then Aziz goes, so are you saying that that Ben's not the genius? level talent that you guys have been making it making him out to, to be to be and the guy like was like oh you're trying to get me in trouble dan you know why you ask kind of why are you asking me that kind of question i thought that dan aziz was was very funny on commentary and i quite enjoyed it because it showed me kind of a different side to dan aziz uh dan aziz has always come across as like very serious obviously a guy he kind of goes about his business and you know as they does the hard graft as they say out there in the uk uh, on the commentary he showed a very humorous side to himself uh and he was really taking pot shots at at um ben whitaker which i found uh very entertaining and the reason i found it ben very entertaining too is i know ben is as very a lot of confidence he's a confident guy he can definitely roll with those kind of punches and and i'm sure that he'll have an opportunity to throw jabs back later on but uh i don't know if they took aziz there because they're thinking of making that fight um Possibly. It, it would it would be interesting if it happened and like i said i'd be very interesting uh, interested in seeing if 
when he does make the jump to a guy like Aziz, which I don't think he should just quite yet, uh, or was Matthew Macklin, there you go, uh, whether or not he'll do these kind of tactics against a, a fighter uh, like like a Dan Aziz or like a Richard Rivera, you know, somebody in kind of the lower top uh, top 10, top 15 uh, of the division. Hmm. Um, it was interesting, like I said, I only heard like a little bit of backlash, a little bit of the rumours of of what the comment, commentary uh, was like. Uh, ben Whitaker went into this, you know, fight, like I said, I had him comfortably winning each and every round. Yes, this opponent came to fight this time, which was refreshing to see. Somebody that's got, a, is he a Southern Area title uh, holder? He's already Central. got a Central, apologies, uh, Central Area uh, title holder. Yeah, sorry, because he's from Liverpool, isn't he? Um, so somebody that is young himself, 23 years of age, you know, that winning record. He didn't go there as a, a journeyman, allegedly a last-minute opponent. But this is the type of fight that Ben needs. But what keeps on happening is we keep we, we do this a lot. And I do still believe that Ben Whitaker is an exceptional fighter. He's early in his career. Um, he's a, a silver medalist. He's created a buzz on the scene, whether people are talking about him because they hate him, talking about him because they like him, they're talking about him. He has a lot of reach. He's doing well with the numbers. And it just seems like there's a lot of people that probably want to see him fail. Like they're just waiting for him to slip up rather than trying to get behind the Brit and support his journey. I do get that vibe um, about people uh, that are around him. He obviously upset the apple cart when he challenged Andy Clark. Um, lovely guy as well, you know, respected pundit, presenter, commentator within boxing. He's been doing it for a very long time when he said that he found the show bolting disrespectful. Uh, ben Whitaker quite rightly said, what do you mean? You're projecting this image out that is making the fans look at me in a different light because you're saying, you're feeding that to them and they're feeding off it, saying that I'm disrespectful. Have you boxed before? Do you understand that this is just a way that, you know, I portray, it's like art in the ring. It's what I do. I'm not being disrespectful. And Ben Whitaker, like I said, when I spoke to him the other day, he mentioned about the only fighter that stuck up for him is Anthony Yard. Because Anthony Yard was asked about him, do you find the way that he does his stuff disrespectful? And Anthony Yard said, disrespectful is when you're talking about people's family members at press conferences, you're going in personal. What he's doing is not disrespectful. In other words, just let him live. He's under the spotlight now. There's a, there's a lot of eyes on him. Um, my advice to him is just to keep doing what he's doing. The only thing that he needs to keep on doing is keep on winning, develop his style, uh, just really kind of like home down on who he's got around him because he's going to get a load of people trying to clamber onto him because yeah. of his potential. And if that starts to feed through and poison your head, that's when you start getting yourself into dangerous situations because you start believing you're way better than you are. It's, 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 cutting out that white noise and just focusing on being a better boxer than what he is um, already. I don't know, has anybody got anything to say on that? But he's not trash. I'm yeah, not no, having no, all the, the rubbish. And, no, no, nobody should He be went sick. in with an opponent that wanted to fight back but still lost every round. Respect to the opponent, but Ben won the fight. I want to ask you about October and base because you'll likely know this. Uh, he never got to actually win the central area title because the fight wasn't at 175, correct? It was at a catch weight. No, he wouldn't. Uh, he wasn't in contention for it. He wasn't trying to um, fight for the title in in the first place. They never, they never put it on the table. I think Leon was. I'm not sure if he's if he still has the central or if he was the central prior. Maybe and he won it, or, he won it in his last fight, the central title. Right, so then in that case, yeah, because it was that because it was last minute, uh, there wasn't any, uh, yeah, there wasn't any weight clause on the on the bout. So as it was at twelve, uh, what was it, uh, twelve nine? Yeah, the, the way he wouldn't have been in contention to win it. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I do, what is his training situation? Is he not with Sugar Hill anymore? Yeah, he's not no. with Sugar Hill anymore. Oh, so he doesn't have a he doesn't have a full time trainer. He's with his amateur coach at the minute, is what he said. Oh, okay. uh, but he said he might go around. May he said he might do what Joshua did, kind of just go around and try try things out, see you, you know, see what he likes, or he might just keep it as as it is for the minute. 
But I definitely, I do think he does need a, a like a full time trainer. But the problem is, all the trainers I think that work best for him are in America, and I know he doesn't necessarily want to keep having to go out there for camps all the time and like not be in and around his circle. What, um, what about the Ingle Gym base in in Sheffield? Um, they kind of let guys, you know, have their style and and fight with their hands low and a lot of movement. You think that the Ingle Gym would be a place that he could settle settle into it in the UK? Mm, not really. Not for me. I, I I know you took that Winker Bank style, but I don't know. I think because they're a lot more built on. They have a certain form that I, that I see. Yeah, there's a, some some decent movement here and there, but I feel like they have a a certain textbook form that they like to drill into people. And I don't know if Dominic will will like Ben's approach. I mean, that you know, remember Naz was with his father more so yeah. than him. But so he looks okay. like he's, who do you think would be good for him in the U.S. Then I think he would do very well with Ishmael Salas. I think he'd do very well with Bozi Ennis. Mm. Because of the Caribbean connection and obviously knowing the movements, like they saw so when I'm looking, I'm looking at the movements. The so Cuba, they've got that, you know, they've got that movement, that that flowing yeah. style that they like to have. I think he would do well with Salas in that respect. But I think Bozy, because obviously the Jamaican thing, like they will have that kind of in in, and you see it with um with Jerron, you see it with some of the others in that camp, and you know Andy Cruz is over there. That's yeah. a perfect person you want to be in camp with if you want to, because he does the same things. They're, they're two very similar characters. Mm. Um, I'll I'll in the UK, that. I think Pat Barrett would would maybe be a good influence. Barrett, yeah. uh, but outside of that, there's you know there's there's a couple other names, but their their gyms has got too many people, so it's like you don't want to be in in a Salas, big crowd. Salas a, Salas I don't know. Other guys. I don't know if you already uh, know, but his his current amateur coach is the one that's been there with him from the beginning, Joby Clayton, and he is the one that studies and studies and always has prided himself on the Cuban style, uh, the Cuban amateur style of boxing. Mm -hmm. So all of that, that's already ingrained in Ben. Ben Whitaker's got his own style as well. That has come from his amateur coach. So... All of that, like you mentioned about Andy Cruz over there, the Cuban, and it all stemmed. His amateur coach is part of that. Yes, Ben Whitaker's got his own style, but no matter who comes into his team, that foundation is there. And I can say that's there from his amateur coach who has been there um, from the beginning. When we see Sugar Hill, Sugar Hill's usually there for fight nights, but he's in, he's in the, the tutelage of his amateur coach. And sometimes I think these things go under the radar and, Sorry if I'm speaking out of turn, but sometimes I think people just need to get a little bit more credit uh, of what their contribution has been. And his, his amateur coach is more than sufficient um, to push him through his career. But I know Ben wants to travel, like you said, base and have a look, shop around and see what's out there. One of the fighters that he spoke about is Devin Haney. Not He's got his dad there. That's his numero yeah. uno but he will go around and he will try out different yeah, camps. And he said, that's mm -hmm. the kind of theme that he's going for. Well, if he's looking for a guy that's not overly uh, committed to multiple fighters, I mean, Bill Haney would definitely be one. He, he's, he's very um, focused on, on Devin and a couple other fighters he works with, but he's got Alicia know. now, hasn't he? I believe so. He yes. Actually, he's, she's there training in Vegas. Um, I've seen her training there. So yeah, but yeah, he doesn't have the biggest stable, you know. Interesting. Well, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to leave it there. Thank you to all nearly what what four hundred and odd of you that are here uh, listening across all of our platforms. Please subscribe to Karma Serene Maestro and Base the Kid, the Hardcore Casual. Um, please add a like, share do all of that magical stuff. We will be doing this again, but we can't say exactly when. Um, and you've been great. The chat has been really good. There's like the comments that have been coming in. I haven't been able to go through all of them, but thank you each and every one of you for the contributions and the super chats. Anything from yourself, Karma, Maestro and Bass before we close? Karma, you first. Is our calm frozen? It's frozen. 
Well, thank you to everybody uh, in the chat that's tuning in, whether it's on X or on YouTube or on uh, any of our various channels. Just a reminder, hit the like button. Uh, if you're new to the channels, make sure you hit the subscribe button. And, uh, you know, uh, subscribe across all of our various channels for diverse boxing opinions and takes. Uh, if you're in the U.S., definitely make sure you check out October Red and Base the Kid. And if you're out there in the U.K., check out me, check out uh, Karma, and uh, let's keep the cr across-the-pond boxing discussions uh, flowing in the future. Yeah, salute to everyone. Salute to you, October, as always. Salute to you, Maestro, the lovely karma. You know, you're watching. Thank you very much. Um, weekend wrap will be dropping about in 15 minutes on my channel for those who are interested. Um, so, yeah, head over there. It's a long one, unfortunately. Uh, I'm really sorry, but there was a lot to go, <laughs> a lot to go over. But, yeah, um, Bless up. We will be doing this again really soon, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and when when the news drops, we will be here to talk about it. So salute to you guys. Yeah, definitely. Uh, adios from us. There's lots of other subjects that we could have covered. My show and base, under this live, obviously when it closes and you can just put the comments in, can you link in some of your videos? So just that if people watch this in arrears, they can see your videos live in the chat. But other than that, guys... Happy Easter. If you don't celebrate it, happy bank holiday Monday, normal day, whatever. We woke up today. Be grateful for that. And like I said, stay ready.